Mr. Charles Cohen is next, and then um, John Brady, I guess. John Brady, maybe, and David Linton, I'm not sure. Good morning, or good afternoon, Mr. Good Cohen. Good afternoon. Uh, Chairman Liebman and members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I've been working under the Act for the past 40 years in various capacities, both for the NLRB and in private practice. While at the NLRB, I personally conducted NLRB elections, served as a hearing officer, litigated in the courts of appeal, and performed the myriad other functions of a board agent, supervisor, and deputy regional attorney. From 1994 to 1996, I had the honor of serving as a member of the board. In my representation of the Coalition for a Democratic Workplace, um, with the five-minute limitation, that gives approximately <coughs> two seconds per page of the 145 pages that my printout was. If I can be presumptuous enough to state as a result of my experience, I believe that I know the tricks of employers, I know the tricks of unions, and I know the tricks of the NLRB. Over four of the last five presidential administrations, the members of the NLRB have pushed the proverbial envelope. Appointees supported by Republicans and Democrats bear some measure of responsibility for the increased polarization. But the, these proposed rules, which have brought us here today, do not push the envelope. Rather, they blow up that envelope and do violence to the fair administration of the act. In virtually every controversial initiative which I have witnessed in the past, the emphasis has been on enforcing the law while plugging opportunities for parties to violate the law or game the system. Unlike any of these other initiatives, this one transparently seeks to deprive law-abiding and non-games-playing employers of their rights to communicate under Section 8C of the Act. The entire employer community is presumed to be on the wrong side, standing ready to trample the rights of employees. The proposal deprives employees of the right to receive key information from all sides in order to be fully informed on how and whether to express their exercise their Section 7 rights. There are some points I believe you, the board, and I know to be the case. Union density in the private sector has been on the decline and is currently below 7% of the private sector workforce. Whatever the cause, the scope of which is beyond this debate, it is deeply distressing to organized labor. Over the past 15 years, unions have been seeking alternatives to winning secret ballot elections, typically through neutrality and card check procedures, often obtained through the pressure of corporate campaigns. Unions have unsuccessfully sought legislation through the Employee Free Choice Act that would have functionally eliminated secret ballot elections conducted by the board. It is commonly known that the longer the period of time between the filing of an election petition and an election, the less likely it is that the employees will select a union. This is so whether or not unlawful or objectionable conduct has occurred. There have been legislative calls from organized labor to dramatically shorten the period of time from petition to election. And the possibility of shortened election periods was widely discussed during the policy debates surrounding the Employee Free Choice Act. No legislative change has occurred. So what has the board come up with? In my view, it is a bag of tricks. It has proffered the gimmick of an emasculated hearing, summary judgment standards, offers of proof, preclusive rules to limit issues, regional director decisions devoid of explanation at the time of issuance, and frenetic time deadlines that disregard other obligations of employers and their counsel, all in attempt to get that election as soon as humanly possible and without giving the employer time to communicate with the employees. There will, of course, be no tear shed for unrealistic burdens on employer counsel. Simultaneously with the proposal of these rules, the Department of Labor's proposed persuader rules are designed to deprive employers of representation in the first place. 
An issue that's come up several times today is what would happen to the STIP rate, the in excess of 90 percent. I believe that that STIP rate will plummet if these rules go into effect. And I used to be in enforcement, and we used to have over 60 attorneys, a substantial portion of whose time was defending technical 8A5 cases, certification test 8A5 cases. That has become a dinosaur now. The number of certification test 8A5 cases one can count on less than one hand. If these rules go into effect, you'll be hiring staff to handle those cases because that will be the option of choice for employers who feel deprived by the system. In his dissent, Member Hayes has taken the unusual step of calling out his fellow employees on his view of the true reasons for the board in proposing these rules. As a former board member, I appreciate how difficult it is to make the kind of statement that he made in his dissent. The majority has denied those motives to be true, stating that these rules are about efficiency and savings, asserting that the effect on the outcome of elections is unpredictable and irrelevant. Only the individual board members know in their hearts and consciences what the true motivation is. But I feel compelled to observe that if the board were called upon to assess motive or mixed motive, as it is often called upon to do, the present circumstances clearly would support an inference of outcome determinative rulemaking. Several of the academic and public interest views expressed here today lay bare the desired effect of these rule changes themselves. Um, that concludes my statement. Thank you. Any comments, questions? The relationship between the hearing and the employer's ability to campaign, currently the, the hearing can cause that period to vary widely. I guess my question is, what is the appropriate period, and why should it vary depending on the amount of litigation? That is, if, if you're, you've stated a very strong position that a certain period of time is necessary, but why should that period of time hinge on the accident of what litigation takes place? And Member Becker, you of course asked that question earlier, and it is a good question, and I believe that analytically it should not. But we have a system. We have a system that has achieved enormously beneficial results of plus 90 percent, people not availing themselves of that opportunity. As Professor Estreicher said, there's a certain legitimacy factor that has to go with that. If the situation is understood, that is one thing. But if it is artificially compressed down to the period of time that we're talking about here, it is my belief that employers will view themselves as not being treated fairly and then look for something else which will give them at least some modicum of time. We've had many initiatives over the years that have resulted in the statistics today. They haven't all gone down easy, to, to be sure, and I was on the board when some of them came in. Um, but we have adapted with that, and employers have had opportunities. Of course, there are some abusers of the system. And just as Mr. Krishner said, not here to defend those abusers of the system. We have the overwhelming percentage that, is, that are not abusers of the system. I believe the board should be very careful about dismantling the system that it has now, and in the name of trying to get these quick elections, doing a lot of injustice and violence to the well-oiled machinery that is there today. As a former board member and, and a practitioner before the board and an employee of the board in other capacities, you, you, you're familiar with um, certain aspects of the process that uh, currently exists, like, for example, that the 25-day hold on elections um, uh, uh, after a hearing uh, for a request for review 
when the the, pur the purpose of that hold for elections is to uh, give the board the opportunity to decide the case, and and it contemplates a stay of an election um, in that process. But in reality, it, it less than one percent of the of, of requests for stays prior to the board's decision get granted. The elections get held and and the ballots are are, are, are impounded. Now, having that 25 days there, you'd have to concede, doesn't serve any real practical purpose, does it? I think it does not necessarily accept a pesky little thing. The statute talks about having an appropriate hearing. I was on the board when Angelica, Barry National, and Bennett Industries came down. I was in the majority in Bennett getting at the games playing employer. This should not be about games, but we have a system where well over 90% of the employers are not even seeking to avail themselves member Pierce of that 25 day stay period of time. That should tell us all that something is being right and that there may well be some abusers to it. But they are not carrying the day here. The tough day-to-day -to -day efforts, the fact that the regional directors and the supervisors and the field examiners and the field attorneys sit on the parties with whom they deal and ensure that the time targets which have been established, which are quick, get enforced. Those are the people that I think have brought this system to its success of successful state. And if you make these kinds of changes, you will be undoing that entire system and creating decades more of games to be played. Can I ask a related question and similar to what Member Pierce asked, but the 25-day period is built in even in those cases where there's no hearing. So it's just part of the process. Is there any reason, I haven't, actually don't think I've heard any speaker today criticize the part of the proposal that talks about doing away with the pre-election request for review. Um, and so I'm, I'm just wondering what your view is that is, given that the vast majority of cases are consent or stipulated to, is there any reason to have this built-in 25-day waiting period? Uh, Chairman Lieben, it, it, it's a chicken and egg situation. It goes right back to Member Becker's question about should it all hinge on it. The world in which we live, for better or worse, has a trade, and that trade is I won't assert my legal rights and trigger a request period of time. And in exchange for that, I'm going to be treated fairly. I'm going to have an opportunity to communicate with my employees. And the system has worked over this period of time. If one's goal is to come hell or high water, have the election in a 10 to 21 day period of time, then the board might be able to make that happen. But I think ultimately, if you look at your statistics five years down the road, you're not going to be getting any real benefit. There aren't going to be that many valid elections that are going to happen in that period of time. And you're going to create an opportunity for the various circuit courts of appeal to pick at these rules one by one in terms of due process that has not been observed. And uh, I believe at that point, it's not worth the candle. Thank you for your thoughts. Appreciate your comments and your being here today.